Hi, this is Andy Wasserman, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher Sutton, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Recently on the show, I did an episode on something called the Lydian Chromatic Concept with Andrew Bishko from the Musical You team. Andrew introduced me to this when he wrote a tutorial about the Lydian scale for our website, and in the process of putting that article together, we came across a man called Andy Wasserman, one of just a handful of people in the world who is fully trained and certified to teach the Lydian chromatic concept. So I was really keen to invite Andy onto the show to share a bit more about this, but as you'll be hearing, Andy is actually a highly remarkable musician, composer, and educator, and we could have easily done a whole series of interviews with him. Andy is a professional pianist, composer, arranger, performer, and producer in genres as diverse as jazz, world music, meaning West African, Asian, Middle East, Native American, Latin, Afro-Cuban, South American, fusion, funk, hip-hop, electronica, blues, new age, and gospel. You will have heard his music on TV and radio, and he's had a fascinating journey to become the musician he is today. I tried to rein myself in and just focus on a few topics, so in this conversation, you'll be hearing about the four music mentors that helped Andy become the musician he is today, and the specific impact each of them had on him. We'll be talking about Andy's view on talent and what we can learn from paying attention to the music that resonates with us. And of course, the Lydian chromatic concept, created by his mentor George Russell, renowned composer and recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. It's a framework for understanding music, which Andy has spent decades helping to develop and teach. It's a bit of a mouthful of a name, but as you'll hear, the Lydian chromatic concept is, in a way, quite simple, in the sense of being fundamental and universal. It's not something I could ask Andy to actually teach in a podcast episode like this, but we talk in depth about what the concept is, the way it can transform how you hear and play music, and how to go about learning more about it if you want to experience that transformation for yourself. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the honor and the privilege to be with you. You play a huge range of instruments and styles of music, perhaps more than any other musician I know. I think I saw a video online of you sharing your collection of musical instruments. How many would you say you own or play at this point? Well, the last time I counted, and this is including a lot of hand percussion, so I am counting each and every finger cymbal and tambourine and flute and whistle, uh, including some huge, beautiful instruments like the Japanese koto and a wide selection of beautiful drums that I'm privileged to have. Uh, The number right now is over 140. Goodness me. And you can play all of these, presumably. I, to certain degrees, I've uh, have studied uh, and learned about the culture that they're connected to. Um, for our listeners uh, who haven't visited my website, in terms of my uh, arts and education program, the World Music Experience, these are wind, string, and percussion instruments uh, that represent um, not every culture, of course, but the cultures that I have gravitated to over the years. Um, And so it's learning about the instrument, the materials, how to play them from people from other cultures, as well as um, how to maintain them, uh, how to play authentic music and not just jam on them. And that's taken me over 40 years. So it's been a lifelong process that actually started and was inspired by growing up in an extremely diverse and multicultural community in Manhattan, um, where people from all around the world Uh, would open up their arms and their homes and even help me get the instruments without having to travel um, uh, in order to um, bridge the gap between uh, Western music and non-Western music. 
Well, it certainly comes across in your music publishing, your catalogue of works. I, I think there are over a hundred releases to your name, and they span such a variety of musical styles. It's clear you have explored uh, um, in all directions. And I'd love to know, if you think back maybe to that time in Manhattan or even earlier, was it always obvious to the people around you that you were going to grow up to be this incredible musician with, uh, you know, an amazing library of musical works and the ability to play so many instruments? Was that obvious when you were a child, do you think? I don't know about to anyone else, um, but to myself, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, when I was very young, uh, I had the privilege to grow up in a home uh, where my grandfather had bought my grandmother a beautiful grand piano. So the resonance of a full sized, you know, beautiful instrument um, was right there at my fingertips. And I heard a sound. I've come now to learn a lot more about that. Um, in fact, I set out in my life, even as a child, to find out what is the sound that I hear. It's not like a sound I heard in my head, you might say but it was a feeling, it was what I now call a resonance. Uh, and as a little child, I used to reach up to the keys before I could even be big enough to sit um, at the piano, and I would press the keys and feel uh, connected to some type of mysterious language that I was communicating to something that was invisible, because let's face it, sound is uh, technically invisible. It's something that we can't touch or taste, but we can hear it. And these vibrations moved me. Um, and uh, at a very early age, I started to realize that it's the music in us that hears the music. So I was immediately drawn towards the inner life of what is this music that's already in me. And for our listeners, I would um, encourage you uh, to be open to this idea, because it's not necessarily discussed all the time. But if you think about it, the music that we love, the music that we've always listened to, the reason we've chosen instruments, because we love their sound, like a violinist who says, I just had to play the violin because I love the sound of the violin. Um, it's because, I like to phrase it, it's the music in us that hears that music. So I immediately went searching for that, which I sometimes refer to as the universal sound. And then uh, um, uh, upon learning about rhythm, I realized that we're all on this uh, beautiful treasure hunt. Um, and we're looking for what the pirates used to call the treasure chest. I like to say it's the treasure in our chest, which is the drum that's beating all the time. So the feeling of my heartbeat, the rhythm of uh, the body, the rhythm in life, that sound, uh, the music in us, uh, I realized um, I have talent on loan to me, and I'm going to devote the rest of my life towards paying back uh, everything I can to work as hard as I can to develop this talent that's on loan to me. And then my life just unfolded with everything that you described. Amazing. I'd like to dwell on this for just a moment, if we may, because talent is a topic that comes up quite a lot on this podcast. And we find that a lot of people, both the very established and successful and capable musicians and those who are doing it purely as a hobby and maybe don't think all that much of their musical abilities, tend to view that word with a bit of skepticism. Um, just because it often does more harm than good, the idea that, you know, you need talent or you can only do what your talent allows you to. And I'd love to hear your perspective because you, you mentioned a couple of things there that you felt you had been blessed with a talent, that you had this ability that you would spend your life trying to cultivate and maximize. But you also talked in terms of us all having music inside us and all having that ability to connect with, as you put it, the universal sound. So how do you think about this topic of talent? Well, it's a great question, Chris. And I do have um, a very strong um, feeling. Um, it can't be proven by science. And some people may be skeptical because we're all filled with self-doubt. Part of that propels us to work very hard. 
um, you know, to strive to become better uh, at our musical skills. But I believe, and I've been teaching now for uh, over 35 years, that every single person is already a musical master. They just don't know it. And so I'm keen on mentoring because I have had, uh, I tell people when they say, what's your claim to fame? Um, I say my claim to fame is that I have had the great, great humbling opportunity to have had not one, two, three, but four very powerful mentors in my life. And I see a mentor more than an instructor as an instructor can tell you what to do, but a mentor tells you what to be, who to be, who you are. And that's where the talent lies, not necessarily in what to do, because that's more of a skill that can be practiced and worked on. And frankly, we, we run into limitations based on our physicality of the instrument and our hands or our voice, etc. cetera. Um, but those can be overcome. Um, but the question of what to be and who you are, um, my mentors showed me um, that... I am already a musical master, I just don't know it. And I'd like to give, if you don't mind, a short analogy, which I think people can relate to, uh, which is one of my favorite ones when my students look at me and go, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm already a musical master, and I, you're right, I don't know it, and I don't think it's possible. And I like to use the analogy of an acorn and an oak tree. And that is that as a little baby acorn... Uh, I find my mentor that's like a towering, beautiful oak tree uh, that offers shade to us striving musicians out on the path. And uh, they are looking at this acorn, and they know that everything that is an oak tree is already completely fully formed within that acorn. The only thing is the acorn has to go through a period of transformation and obliterate its acornness. It can't identify and stay on the acorn level, which I would say that's people who say, well, I don't have the talent. That's because they're only looking at their acorn hood, so to speak. But when a mentor can say, you are an oak tree, and nobody can deny that within an acorn is an oak tree, all it has to do is uh, go uh, fall beneath the, the ground and uh, grow roots and then a little stalk, and that stalk could turn into a huge tree trunk with branches, and guess what? End up giving birth uh, to thousands of other acorns over time. So if people would look at themselves as already having the potentiality, is another way of saying it, for all the ultimate talent that is on loan to all of us, I mean, especially with YouTube and the Internet, I think, to quote uh, the great jazz trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, it's obvious that no one has a monopoly on talent. There is so much musical talent everywhere, and I'd like to encourage all of our listeners and all the members at Musicality U um, that, that you are all masters of music, and um, through finding a mentor and the other processes that your website offers and your school, uh, that maybe people can find um, out how to go from an acorn into the oak tree that's already within them. Wonderful. I, I love that analogy. I think that's a beautiful way of looking at it. And I think it very neatly helps people reconcile the idea of the talent they admire and are inspired by and maybe a little intimidated by with the idea that they could have just as much talent brewing inside themselves, just waiting to be unleashed. If it's not too simplistic. I'm sure we can't boil a lifetime down to a short segment of a podcast, but I'd love to hear if you wouldn't mind a little bit about those four mentors and maybe the, the transformation each of them helped you through in terms of who you were before and after working with them. Well, um, thank you so much for asking that because uh, these people deserve not to be forgotten. Um, they were, uh, and none of them are currently alive anymore. Um, but they were some of the greatest uh, musicians and innovators and teachers. I sought them out uh, instead of looking to have um, some type of brilliant career for myself. I thought if I can find 
and be accepted by some of the greatest musicians on the planet. And those oak trees <laughs> will uh, nurture um, and nourish my acorn hood to transform into hopefully something like them. That would be the greatest thing that I could do. So I was lucky growing up in Manhattan. There was a school called the Metropolitan Music School uh, near Central Park. And um, I'd like to say, because I noticed on your website, that you encourage a tremendous amount of ear training and listening skills. Uh, in order to sign up for lessons with my first mentor, her name was Anne Bacon Dodge. And for those people that know um, uh, some very wonderful books that were written in the early part of the 20th century um, uh, by uh, my teacher's husband, Roger Pryor Dodge, my teacher is named Anne Bacon Dodge, and um, Roger Pryor Dodge was a, a, a historian, a jazz historian. So she knew an awful lot about that. But in order to sign up for lessons with her, they made me go every Saturday for three hours and do music dictation and ear training. Of course, this is prior to computers, so everything was done with an instructor. Um, and I had to study ear training, listening skills, and music theory uh, just in order to take private lessons, and that was extremely helpful. So she created the foundation and taught me about the blues, about uh, playing Bach two-part inventions, and set a foundation for me as a pianist. That's my favorite instrument and my lifelong um, main uh, work, because it uh, takes all of that. And um, the, the next great opportunity I had was uh, Dwight Mitchell, uh, that's D-W-I-K-E, an unusual first name. Uh, actually, the longest-running uh, jazz ensemble, which was a duo in the history of jazz, was Dwight Mitchell and his partner in uh, musicality, uh, Willie Ruff, who is actually pretty famous because he's been a professor at Yale for most of his life teaching jazz. And they toured the world as the Mitchell-Ruff duo, where Dwight played the piano and uh, Willie Ruff would switch between bass and French horn. Uh, Dwight Mitchell and I had a relationship that lasted 30 years, and he's the one that really uh, allowed me to understand everything uh, orchestrally that can be uh, expressed on piano. Uh, and I will say that uh, it's very difficult to learn about music without learning about yourself. And you start seeing things in your own character, your personality, hang-ups, or uh, things that have affected you in your life emotionally in any kind of negative way. Those really have to be removed in order to feel free, especially in jazz, to feel free enough to express the joy and the sadness and everything as you improvise and create new music every day. So he also helped me as a young person to grow and to learn about myself and help me overcome things that I needed to do as I grew into a more mature adult. That was followed by him saying one day, uh, he used to call me his son, his musical child. He said, son, you have to go to school now, uh, not just lessons with me. So I sought out George Russell, uh, the innovative band leader, composer, and creator of the Lydian Chromatic Concept of Tonal Organization, and luckily was accepted full-time as a student, um, undergraduate level at New England Conservatory of Music. And I ended up becoming so close to George that um, he certified me as a teacher. I would take over his classes when he'd go on tour. I would help him with his seminars and then worked for 20 years uh, amongst a staff of other dedicated uh, people um, and students of his as an editorial assistant for the current edition of his treatise, The Lydian Chromatic Concept of Tonal Organization, The Art and Science of Tonal Gravity. There's no way to be even begin to tell you uh, how he affected my life on every level, especially opening up my ears to sounds and uh, the language of music, um, which now I refer to as uh, relating to the hypothesis called linguistic relativity, which basically says that new languages that you learn or the inherent language that you grow up speaking has a definitive effect on your consciousness, how you view the universe, 
how you relate to your life. And so when you learn a new language, like the Lydian chromatic concept, it actually alters your entire perspective through lingu linguistic relativity to uh, everything that you perceive. And again, this was a lot of internal growth, that music that's inside of you. And then finally, I realized that the heart of jazz and the heart of most what we now call world or world beat music uh, is rhythmically based, that there's also a code, I call it the timekeeper's code, where the beats themselves speak, and it's a living language of rhythm. And uh, through amazing amount of uh, luck, I became uh, very close to Papalaji Kamara, who is considered to be, in the history books, the very first uh, West African drummer in the 1940s and 50s to take the djembe drum that everybody now all around the world is familiar with the djembe, um, the most popular West African drum. He was the first one credited to taking it around the world when he toured with Les Ballet African du, du Ketaba Fotoba. And so um, Papalaji was already an aged person, but still teaching. And I ended up working with him and living with him, and he's the one that taught me uh, the roots of West African drumming. And when you put all of those things together, uh, it's inspiration that to this day fuels uh, every note that I play, everything I feel about music in my heart, and for sure um, propels my dedication to wanting to pass it on to my students and anyone that I can possibly help. Wow, thank you. I, I'll i admit when I was preparing for this interview, I was simultaneously super excited and a little bit overwhelmed because you have had an incredible journey so far and I feel like we could do at least an hour-long podcast episode on each of those phases of your musical development and really dig into what you learned and how it worked. And uh, I would love to to spend a day with you. <laughs> so I, I had to challenge myself to try and narrow it down a little because we could explore in so many interesting directions. And one thing you touched on there jumped out, which is the Lydian chromatic concept. And we recently did a couple of podcast episodes which touched on this one with a member of our team, Andrew Bishko, and then a follow-up episode providing a very brief introduction. And as we said at the time, this was really just scratching the surface of what is a very substantial and fascinating thing. But we've already received some feedback suggesting that this was one of the most interesting and mind-blowing episodes we've done of the podcast so far. And so I felt like that was the perhaps the most important thing to touch on in today's episode with you and really draw from your amazing experience. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd love if we could talk a little bit about the Lydian chromatic concept, which, as you say, you, you learned from George Russell, its originator. Well, thank you so much. And I would like our members, the members of uh, Musicality U and whoever is tuning into this podcast um, to know that um, it speaks volumes about the integrity of, uh, of your organization, Chris, um, that you will um, allow uh, this beautiful knowledge to be shared um, and be open you know, to adding this to the other elements of music theory that you're trying to share to enhance uh, your members and listeners' skill. So thank you so much for being open to the Lydian chromatic concept. I just want you to know that I appreciate that. And I know that if George was alive today, uh, he passed away at age 86 in 2009, so he's not here. Um, but he would also uh, thank you uh, for recognizing that there is great value, especially for musicians today. Um, what I, I would like to uh, allow people to um, feel a little more comfortable about the concept and rest assured about something that uh, is usually not brought out because people see it immediately as something that might be so different and um, uh, perhaps uh, diametrically opposed to traditional Western music theory. And I, through my own personal experience, I can 100% guarantee that what I'm about to tell you is the truth because I saw George Russell sitting at a desk laboring for decades to 
have his system of music be very inclusive of already existing Western music and even bend the rules a little bit so that people coming to the Lydian chromatic concept with already existing knowledge from traditional Western music theory lessons and all of the ramifications of melody, harmony, texture, rhythm, um, and specifically, of course, most people know that the jazz improvisers, uh, including uh, Miles Davis and John Coltrane, change the direction of jazz in, towards the modal period, as it's known, and illustrated by the album Kind of Blue, having been turned on to, in the camaraderie uh, of uh, their circle of incredible culture, um, uh, mostly in New York in the 1950s and early 60s, uh, through George Russell and the Lydian Chromatic Concept. And the improvisers since then that have come to George, um, he was very well aware that we can't say, forget everything you learned, or it's relevant, or the worst thing to say, which is the opposite of what the concept says, which is, this is bad or wrong. So what I, the first thing that I would like to illuminate for people, because it also might be new, is that what George did, first of all, was stand back and say, what is the music itself telling us about its own self-organized unity? And when he posed that question, which is an extremely deep question and shows you what an amazing human being he was, he realized that just like physics and the physicists who study the physical universe, um, most everyone agrees, uh, especially those people that have learned from Albert Einstein, that gravity is a force <laughs> that we are all um, subject to, uh, just like the fact that you and I are now conducting an interview not like Mary Poppins, where we're floating to the ceiling uh, having tea. Uh, but we're actually sitting on the ground, and uh, gravity is pulling us towards the center of the Earth. So once George realized that music is physics, it's like waves, it's particles, it's vibrations, um, that gravity had to be recognized as perhaps, and he ended up proving it to a great degree, the prime moving force of how music itself, not what we do with it, but how music itself uh, is expressing itself, um, its, its actions. So he calls it tonal gravity. And when one looks at the existence of tonal gravity, immediately there is a verticality, straight up and down, like if you have a circle with uh, the map north-south axis, and once you have that, there automatically is a horizontal axis. That would be a line going from east to west. Now, Western music theory, in conjunction, in relativity to the verticality of the Lydian scale, which I know your other podcasts have already described why they are like a ladder of fifths, uh, and that's what makes them vertical with having one single dough. That is a perfect explanation for chord scale unity um, that allows people to understand the origin of every chord in a parent scale. But that horizontal axis is just as important, and that is the resolving tendency in the nature of the major scale, which most people define as a structure of two tetrachords, like in the key of C. C, D, E, F is called a tetrachord, whole step, whole step, half, and then you go up a whole step to G, and then you have a second tetrachord, G, A, B, C, and that's one of the reasons that you feel the sense of two does and a sense of resolution. It's perfect for that. And the reason that those, as a cross in the center of a, of, of a circle, the reason that those are so perfect in describing all of music, so you have the Lydian chromatic concepts attention to verticality mixed with Western music's uh, perfection of resolution, evidenced by the major scale and the Lydian scale, it mirrors life. Because when we're in the now, when we're not trying to achieve anything or we're not goal-oriented in life, 
we're actually in a vertical state of consciousness. And when we have to go anywhere or do anything or create a task, we're in, in our part of our daily lives, constantly in a state of goal orientation. And the tension and the release of the goal orientation, and then the relaxation and unity of being in the now, is music showing us that it's actually a mirror of life. And so, the first thing that I want to, you know, summarize based on what I just said is, for all your listeners, please know that the Lydian chromatic concept is completely open and shows how beautifully traditional Western music theory fits within the discovery of tonal gravity and the verticality and the chord scale alliance that is uh, shown so beautifully uh, by George Russell's concept. Fantastic. I, I'm so glad you started with that because, uh, well, I know a lot of our listeners' heads are exploding right now <laughs> with some of the concepts you introduced there. Um, so I, I think in a moment we'll, we'll break some of that down a little more. But you mentioned earlier, you know, the prevalence of teaching material online. We live in an age of Google and YouTube. And I'm sure some of our listeners have had this experience where you're looking around online for interesting music things and you stumble across someone who says they've got the secret to music and how it works and they've invented their own music theory. And, you know, in some cases they've just taken a subset of music theory and put their own labels on it, their own names and declared it to be new. And in fact, it's, it's just new names on old things. And in other cases, they've discovered some way of explaining things that works for a very small subset of music. But actually, when you look at it, you realize, no, it's, it's quite, quite focused and isolated and doesn't really generalize. I think, you know, it would be easy if someone has stumbled across a mention of the Lydian chromatic concept online for them to be a bit skeptical because it does make some bold claims about its universal application and how powerful it can be. And I think, you know, as we've touched on, it obviously comes from an incredible pedigree from George Russell himself. And I think anyone listening to you just describe it will understand that this is not uh, a strange and kind of flimsy alternative to music theory. This is genuinely something that has been very carefully developed and worked on and thought through and, as you put it, complements and extends what we think of as traditional music theory. Um, it's not reinventing the wheel, as it were. Yes. Well, George himself described the Lydian chromatic concept um, uh, as being radical in the sense that once he saw that there was a center of tonal gravity and the possibility of a unified tonal gravity field, which um, I hope this isn't a stretch because most people feel comfortable with multiplying 12 times 12, but maybe not thought about the fact that every key of which in equal temper tuning, which is what the leading chromatic concept is working within, it does not work with uh, scale systems from other parts of the world or earlier in history. It is based on uh, the overtone of the fifth uh, and our tuning system of being able to play any song in any key has to do with, you know, the equal tempered tuning. So we are limiting it to that. Um, but that in equal tempered tuning, we have 12 notes that can all act as a do, like you play a song in the key of C or G flat or D flat, etc. And you have 12 possible tones, which are also those same 12 tones, uh, not a totally different subset um, of reordering them for the so-called 12-tone chromatic scale. So if you multiply 12 times 12, you actually realize that there is a limit as uh, incredible as it might seem to try to master it, of 144 possible intervals of, and here's the key word, close to distant relationship to the center. Now, why is that a little bit different and hard for people to wrap their minds around relative to Western music theory? Because in Western music theory, we think number one of, and taught through the history of theory itself, consonant and dissonant. And George was saying, if we ask what the music itself is telling us, we have to try to be more objective, because that viewpoint is a quite objective a viewpoint. And consonant and dissonant tends to be a little bit more subjective. Uh, what one person hears as consonant, another person may hear as dissonant. And for sure, there's dissonant music that people love to listen to that other people say, I got a headache within the first 10 seconds. So, George says that instead of saying what's right or wrong, consonant or dissonant, 
We have close to distant relationship where we have ingoing, semi-ingoing, semi-outgoing, and outgoing levels of tonal gravity. And what he says is that he's created this map that doesn't tell you where to go, but it shows you all of the possible places. So that getting back to the what we said earlier is it's critical for every musician, no matter whether they're a hobbyist or they're just learning or they've been playing forever, to go inside themselves and say, why do I play music? What does music mean to me? What is my sound? What is the music in me? All of those type of esoteric inner questions. And then realize that you could look at a map, for example, um, I'm comfortable with the United States where I live, and some people would say if you want to go from New York City to San Francisco, from the East Coast to the West Coast, there's an interstate called Route 80 that goes all across the country. Well, if that's the way you want to get there, go. But what happens if you have a relative in Atlanta, Georgia, and then you want to go to the uh, Glacier National Park in Montana, and then you want to go actually back in the opposite direction because you want to hear some blues in Chicago, and you have this meandering way to actually get to San Francisco, if that's what you're expressing, the Lydian Chromatic will show you musically how to navigate through that without making any judgments and showing you based on the criteria of what you hear and that can never be taken from the forefront, that if you don't hear it first, you're going to be a little bit more lost because you're going to be relying more on your intellect than this mystical, magical experience that we call sound and how we tend to feel it more in our heart and uh, you know, our inner self. So I hope that that's helpful and that makes sense. It does, and I feel like you were anticipating the questions that were popping into my head there. I, I guess that comes from you know decades of experience working with this concept and teaching it to people. But I, something that's come up on the podcast a few times before is that a lot of musicians struggle with music theory, partly because they don't see the point of it to a large extent. You know, it, it can seem interesting from an intellectual perspective and okay, it, it's good to know how music works, but for a lot of musicians, it seems like a by the way thing and they don't really see the usefulness of music theory. And, you know, we've talked on the podcast before about how if you approach it from a different perspective, music theory is intensely useful and empowering by allowing you to do the things in music you instinctively want to do. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more uh, about what you touched on there, which is that the Lydian chromatic concept too can be this enabling force. Maybe you could uh, give some examples of um, what it allows musicians to do in practical terms that they maybe wouldn't be able to do without that understanding. Well, excellent question. And um, I would like to, again, represent this through the way that George said it himself. Um, he drew a line between uh, what may sound a little bit harsh, but it's not, uh, a mechanical approach to art in general, which you might say is a musician who learns songs and a repertoire, reads notes, and doesn't really understand uh, what the music itself uh, is saying as a language. And then a musician who is playing um, not in a mechanical way where the mu music theory becomes much more important. What George felt, and I've studied in my work of music from around the world, uh, and especially jazz as an improvisational art form, that uh, the way that I like to phrase it, Chris, is music is an ancient language that I'm convinced in my study of music history, especially non-Western cultures, that people used to understand. They would understand a story for every beat that every West African drum would play um, and the way that it was the inflection of those micro rhythms and uh, spe specific timings. Uh, most of us who study music of the classic European style know that if you play Mozart and you don't phrase it correctly between what's legato and what's staccato, you change the sound of every one of his beautiful phrases um, because the phrasing is so important. So if you go really deep into the fact that music itself is a language that we used to understand, then you'd have to say in modern times, especially due to um, noise pollution, 
uh, being bombarded by all the media. Yes, a life of haste. We're all moving very fast. There's a lot of noise in the world. That part of our brain, because it is a, a language center in our brain, actually is has gone dormant. And so most of us don't really understand specifically what I'm talking about, about the language of music. That's why I believe it's so important to learn any and all theories. And like I said, the Lydian chromatic concept complements in its verticality the horizontal nature of Western music theory, where you recognize tonal gravity and uh, the scales that come from a vertical sense of a scale with one doe, the Lydian scale, and uh, the horizontal um, nature of the major scale. However anybody wants to approach it, the advantage to learning music theory and why it's so important is that you understand more about what you're playing so that if you do want to change it up, if you do want to interpret it on a deeper level, if you do want to improvise, if you do want to what I call spontaneous composition, meaning you're not sitting down to write a composition that's going to be recreated and frozen in time and played the same way all the time, but you're just sitting down to play. The majority of students who come to me, some of them very advanced, some of them music teachers and professional musicians who want to take uh, private lessons with me on the leading chromatic concept, I hear them play and I'm like, wow, you are amazing. Now, can you just make up something on the spot on your instrument and just play something? And they're like, I've never done that. I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. I say, wait a second, aren't we improvising this conversation verbally speaking? They say, yes. So you don't know what I'm about to ask you or say but you hear it, and then using the language that we're speaking in English, you answer back. We're, we're born improvisers, all of us, and every day you wake up. Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're inspired, and you're walking down the street by a gorgeous flower or a cloud in the sky. Sometimes you feel upset about something that happens in life. Every day, these new experiences, you're improvising through life. Well, without the knowledge, Chris, of the inherent language of music, also called music theory, you don't really understand what it is that you're doing. And that's what George was trying to say is, is that to get away from a more mechanical approach of just being an instrumentalist, as, as incredible as that is and important, um, and a lot of people that's enough because that takes so much work on its own. Um, but if you're going to try to explore more within as well as spontaneity, composition, creativity, and I'd like to point out, which I think is very important, analysis. If you really love the music of Steely Dan, and you want to take a song like Asia, which, believe it or not, George Russell, as my first assignment said, I want you to analyze the entire chord progression, the scale structure, and the melodic formation in the song Asia, by Zeely Dan. I was like, wow, I thought you'd pick something by My uh, Miles or, or Coltrane. Um, so he, he was open to all styles of music. But let's say you love the song Asia by Steely Dan. Wouldn't you love to know so much about music theory and everything it had to offer that you would be able to analyze and then say, oh, now I have a greater understanding of what it is that resonates so deeply and that I find so beautiful and engaging by this artist or this particular song. Fantastic. You've painted such an inspiring and vivid picture there, I think, of how understanding the Lydian chromatic concept could transform your experience of music. And certainly I'm very excited to learn more. As I mentioned in our previous episode, this is all quite new to me. And uh, it's something I find deeply fascinating and appealing. Could you ex um, share a little bit about what it looks like to learn the Lydian chromatic concept and maybe what our listeners could consider next if they're feeling inspired and eager to know more? Well, thank you, Chris. Um, the work that went into the fourth and final edition, the Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization, the, the art and science of tonal gravity, which is quite a title, um, was so immense Everyone works so hard, almost everyone, on, you know, the books that they write and the CDs and the music that they create. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish the world at large that was not artistic would have a greater appreciation, especially today, of how important it is um, for us to reward all artists in every field and every discipline, music and every other dance and, and uh, 
graphic literature, et cetera. I think we, we all know through the, uh, the making of on the DVDs when we see what these movie makers go through. But all of us go through that. And what George Russell and myself and the other editorial assistants went through, George Russell's uh, wife and now widow Alice Norbury Russell uh, went through um, to get this fourth and final edition out there. Um, because a lot of people still get a lot of mileage and use a couple of editions starting in 1953. But George realized that he had to flesh this out over decades and really work even harder, like I said before, on, in, on showing people how you incorporate traditional Western music theory along with um, the Lydian chromatic concept. So uh, I would encourage... Uh, people to go to the only place uh, around the world where you can legally get as an outlet for this book, which is a hardcover book, so it is pricey, but its value is, uh, uh, it's invaluable, um, it, and that's at Amazon.com, and you would just type in Lydian Chromatic Concept, and you'll see a few uh, sellers, but I would like people to know that Concept Publishing is George Russell's own uh, uh, company still run by his estate and um, Alice Russell and so be sure to order it from directly from Concept Publishing which is for sale um, on Amazon um, there is a website called the Lydian Chromatic Concept dot com and it has a forum that uh, I am not one of the uh, forum moderators but there are wonderful people who for years have been moderating, and uh, don't anybody be afraid or intimidated as a newbie uh, to just show up and say, hey, I don't know anything about this, or I want to learn about it, um, and you'll see a lot of information. I'm sure people are familiar with forums, and it is free. You don't have to pay for a membership. You can just create, um, to my knowledge, just create a, a username and log on to the forum, which you'll see at that website. I would encourage people to listen to George Russell's music. Please keep in mind, his music is not the Lydian chromatic concept. He had, like many of us, we would say we wear many hats. When he put on his Lydian chromatic concept, which, by the way, we just call the concept for short. So when he put on the concept hat, that would be one side of his creation force. When he was a band leader and composer and musician, and a lot of people don't know that in the 1940s, uh, he's credited with, along with Dizzy Gillespie, whose Dizzy Gillespie's band played this, uh, the very first uh, mixture of traditional jazz with Afro-Cuban called Cubana B, Cubana Bop. So before George created the Lydian Chromatic Concept, he was already acknowledged as a phenomenal arranger and composer by the greats of the 40s, like Dizzy Gillespie. Um, but if you listen to George's uh, own compositions, and uh, it doesn't mean that what you hear is what you're going to create with the Lydian Chromatic Concept. The proof of that is just listen to my music. My music doesn't sound anything like George's music. Um, and I've been working with the concept now since uh, 1979. Um, and to every single day, it gives me new inspiration and new ideas. I call it the fountain of youth. That's one of the reasons that, to me, its value is proven. Because if after all that time, it's still feeding new ideas every single day, every note, every song, then there has to be value to it. Um, but if you listen to George's music, uh, which is mostly for a large ensemble, you will certainly get an idea of other things and amazing things, uh, particular pieces like uh, African Game, and uh, these are compositions, Listen to the Silence, um, Electronic Sonata for Souls Loved by Nature, an amazing title for a piece, right, Chris? Um, as well as, as, well as a, a piece that I, um, he played for me at a lesson that I had, um, and uh, it was like a nuclear explosion going uh, on in my head when I first heard it after he had just gotten back from mastering it at the recording studio. It's called Vertical Form. And, um, and then, of course, if you have been inspired by the modal movement of jazz from Kind of Blue on and pianists like Bill Evans, who was a student of George and the Lydian Chromatic Concept, listen to their music and... Uh, through listening with the ideas of vertical and horizontal, of Lydian scales and major scales, 
of other things that have to do with close to distant relationships, your ear will tune you in to an awful lot. And that's just as important, if not more, than learning the nuts and bolts uh, when you actually, uh, you know, study it. There is also some information on my website uh, and georgerussell.com is a, a lot of information about him. So that's the best that I can do. And perhaps in the future, Chris, um, you know, we can open up more um, of the actual information about the leading chromatic concept uh, to your members and your listeners, uh, you know, as musicality you sees fit. Perfect. Thank you. Well, yes, I, I would love to tempt you to come and give a masterclass for Musical You in future because this is a topic that I know our members would be really excited to learn more about. Thank you for giving those suggestions of where people can learn more. We will put links directly to each of those resources in the show notes for this episode. And all that remains is to say a big thank you, Andy. You've shared so generously today about your own life and the mentors you've had and about the Lydian chromatic concept. And it's just been a, a real pleasure to talk to with you so thank you well thank you chris and um a shout out to everyone on your staff uh as well as the members who are lucky to uh, be a part of uh everything that you're working on because i can see that uh just like what george russell dwight mitchell uh, papalaji kamara all of the great musicians of the world have dedicated themselves to which is integrity and excellence and we all we can do is just stay humble um, and and strive uh, with the best of our ability and uh, with the joy that music brings. And this world certainly can use the joy of, of beauty and truth that uh, is inherent in the message of music um, and have fun while we're doing it. I always remind my students, that's why we call it playing music. Uh, all of this stuff, and I hope it didn't seem too heavy or weighty or philosophical, but it all leads to the internal process um, that should be uh, a source of tremendous joy, uh, rejuvenation, um, and excitement to have fun playing and sharing music, especially jamming. And um, I wish everyone the best of luck in their musical endeavors. And thanks again for the honor to share this time with you. Unlock your full musicality with Musical You membership. Find out more at musicalitypodcast.com forward slash join. So normally I record the intro and outro segments for these podcast episodes within a day or two of the interview while everything is fresh. But in this case, I must confess a few weeks have passed. And it's because there was such a ton packed into this episode and I really had to give it a chance to all sink in before I could come back and try to summarize it. Andy speaks in a simple, down-to-earth way, but there is immense wisdom and insight in what he shares. Let me see if I can recap. From early on, Andy was drawn to exploring music and pursuing the captivating sound he had first heard from his grandmother's piano. He felt connected to some mysterious language, and I loved his way of explaining it, that we all have music inside us, and when we respond instinctively to music we like... It's the music inside us that is responding. That inner music is something we have the potential to share with the world, and this, for him, is the heart of talent. Not as something reserved for the rare few, but something which we all, like a tiny acorn contains everything needed to become a great towering oak, have the potential to grow into and nurture and fully realize. And he makes a clear distinction between an instructor who teaches you how to do something, and a mentor who teaches you who to be. And it was awe-inspiring to hear of the mentors who helped shape him into the musician he is today, and the impact each had on how he understands and creates music. At the Metropolitan Music School in New York, he studied with Anne Bacon Dodge, which involved intense ear training and set the foundation for how he would approach the piano, which would become his main instrument. That his piano skills leveled up over the course of 30 years being mentored by Dwight Mitchell, one half of the longest-running jazz ensemble ever, the Mitchell-Ruff duo. Dwight opened his eyes to the orchestral possibilities of piano and all of the self-understanding and personal development that can come through exploring musical expression. When Dwight told him it was time to graduate, as it were, Andy sought out George Russell, a man who has literally been declared a genius, and over the course of 20 years, Andy studied under and then worked alongside George, helping him to develop and teach the Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization. During this, 
Andy began to sense the timekeeper's code of music, the language of rhythm, and he became close to Papalaji Kamara, the man credited with bringing the djembe drum and West African drumming into the wider world, and who helped Andy develop the rhythmic fuel that now infuses everything he plays. As I said in the conversation, it would have been easy to focus a whole podcast episode just on any one of those amazing mentors, but we chose to talk mainly about the theory created by his mentor George Russell, the Lydian chromatic concept. In our previous episode on the topic, Andrew and I talked in quite practical terms about the Lydian chromatic concept and why the Lydian scale is at the heart of it, and how you can begin to explore these ideas. But it was fantastic to have the chance to talk with Andy more about the bigger picture. Where did this come from, and why does it matter, and how does it relate to what we think of as traditional Western music theory? I think it was probably clear from how Andy spoke of it that he sees this as something that can and perhaps should be front and centre in how we understand music, because it brings us back to an instinctive understanding of what the music itself is trying to tell us. I liked the point he made about linguistics, that so much of how we perceive and understand the world is determined by the language or languages we speak. And viewed in those terms, I think it becomes much easier to see why a person might want to study music theory, and the Lydian chromatic concept in particular. This isn't an intellectual exercise for the sake of curiosity or something you should do. This is something that will impact every musical experience you have, and enable greater freedom in the music you play and create. I know that some of what we discussed may have seemed abstract or complicated depending on how much you already know about music theory, but I do want to reiterate what Andy said, that these are highly practical ideas too, and although the study of it can clearly go very deep, I think it's like music itself, in that it can at the same time be very deep and profound, and very simple. I like that he always reminds his students that we call it playing music for a reason, We should remember the spirit of playfulness and joy, even when immersed in the depths of theory and complex understanding. I'll admit I'm not familiar enough with the Lydian chromatic concept yet to give a personal opinion, but I do find it fascinating and potentially extremely impactful, so I'm very much hoping we can have Andy come and present something on the concept for members at Musical U to get them started with it in a practical way. Until then, the canonical source for learning about the concept is the official book on the subject, and as Andy mentioned, you want to make sure you get the genuine version from the publisher, which is available on Amazon, and we'll have a direct link to that in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where I'll be picking up on Andy's comment about mentors to talk about the differences between teachers, coaches, and mentors, and how each of them can help you in your musical journey. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.